Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu and welcome to Ramadan with MTA. During the blessed month of Ramadan, every weekday we are going to be with you. We are with you. We have been with you. Bringing you different segments in which we talk about verses of the Holy Quran, narrations of the Holy Prophet وسلم, different books found in the Ahmadiyya literature and a health segment as well as a cooking segment that we present to you. So let's start without further ado with our first segment for today and that is the recitation of the Holy Quran. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا دَاوُدَ وَسُلَيْمَانَ عِلْمًا وَقَالَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي فَضَّلَنَا عَلَى كَثِيرٍ مِّنْ عِبَادِهِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And we gave knowledge to David and Solomon, and they said, All praise belongs to Allah who has exalted us above many of his believing servants. So this was a verse from Surah Nabal here with us to talk about this verse and as well as the next few segments is uh, our guest Daniel Kalu Sahib. Daniel Sahib, Murabi Sahib, Assalamu Alaikum, Jazakallah for your time. Alaikum Assalamu Alaikum, Jazakallah for your time. Alaikum Assalamu Alaikum, we're told that prophets were given knowledge and in this verse specifically we're talking about Hazrat Sulaiman and Hazrat Dawud What is meant when the Holy Quran talks about given knowledge or ilma, what, what does that refer to? Right, so with regards to this, Hazrat Khalifatul Masih the first, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, explained it in a very beautiful manner. He said that there are various factors, you know, um, with regards to attaining knowledge, which need to be kept in mind. Mm -hmm. For example, finance, you need to be able to afford books, schooling, tuition. Your health, you need to have a certain level of health in order to study. Intellect, obviously that matters as well. Good teachers, right? Opportunities, but above all, he mentions that above all, it's God's grace that truly matters. And that's why this verse states, Ataina, that we gave them mm. ilm, that obviously they had all of those other factors available to them. But at the end of the day, it was God's grace which allowed them to reach that certain level of knowledge, which is worth being praised and mentioned in the Holy Quran. And how did this knowledge benefit them? Well. Hazur gives a really beautiful example in the sense that he says that, look, even within animals, you know, when a dog is untrained, it's not really worth anything. But teach that dog how to hunt, give him that knowledge, you know, and, and you know, its rank and status just goes far and beyond other dogs. It reminds me of a conversation that I think was, has a Muslim at the, at the time of the Promised Messiah, they were having this discussion at the dinner table as well. What is more, what, what's better, money or knowledge? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and then as the Muslim of Islam said that none of this matters if you don't have Allah's grace. Exactly, yeah. Allah's grace, that's what it is. Yeah. Are they know, we gave, you know, so that's what we need to be praying for, Allah's grace. Uh, Daniel Sab, um, I also want to ask you, why have these two prophets specifically been mentioned here? What's right. the reason behind that? So for the, re the reason for that is that of all the Israelite prophets, right, these two have been mentioned, so surely they must have some sort of significance amongst the other Israelite prophets. Mm -hmm which they did. Hazrat Dawud al-Islam, he was a mighty warrior. You know, he was a, a mighty statesman. Uh, he established, you know, he was a nation builder. He established the Judean kingdom. He was the one who gathered all the tribes and united them uh, into one country, which, you know, which went from the River Nile all the way to the Euphrates, you know, from Egypt to Mesopotamia at the time. It was a vast kingdom. So this was Hazrat Dawud al-Islam uh, establishing that kingdom. We have Hazrat Sul Sulaiman al-Islam as well, mm. who consolidated this kingdom, who improved this kingdom to such an extent that, you know, this kingdom came to be known as a great power in, in the world. That's why these two prophets specifically are mentioned. And also, in addition to this, the mention of these Israelite kings, you know, it implies a prophecy that rulers of just as mighty or even mightier kingdom and a grand or even grander kingdom um, will 
come from the progeny of the whole, or from the Ummah, followers of the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the Holy Quran in uh, Surah Muzammal uh, verse number 16 draws a comparison between Hazrat Musa Islam and the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Hazrat Musa Islam had such great nation builders mm -hmm. and kings amongst his followers, the Holy Prophet Sallallahu was to have great, you know, um, kings f follow his footsteps as well. You know, great nations and empires as well, which we saw as t history testifies. Wonderful. Jazakallah for that, Daniel Sahib. Um, time, unfortunately, is not on our side, so we're going to have to move on to our next segment, and that is the Hadith segment. Let's take a look at today's Hadith first. عن أنس قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم انصر أخاك ظالما أو مظلوما قالوا يا رسول الله هذا ننصره مظلوما فكيف ننصره ظالما قال تأخذ فوق يديه حضرت أنس may Allah be pleased with him narrated that the Prophet of Allah may peace and blessings of Allah be upon him said help your brother be he the oppressor or the oppressed the companion said O Prophet of Allah we understand that we should help him when he is the aggrieved party, but how should we help him when he is the wrongdoer? He said, hold his hand. Then it's up, as is the case with many of the hadiths that we are going through, um, if you read them for the first time, they seem you know, very simple, very easy to understand. But there, there's a lot more to the words of the Holy Prophet ﷺ because at the end of the day, he was you know, the perfect Prophet, the perfect man. So in this hadith specifically, as the Sahaba asked, uh, you know, O Prophet of Allah, we understand one side, well, how do we do the other side? Explain that to us one more time. Right, so uh, the Sahaba were, you know, seeing this from this perspective where, you know, the, there's a contradiction in the sense that bonds of brotherhood, you know, yeah. they demand that you help your brother in any situation, whether he's good or bad, right? But then that's a contradiction, right? Um, how can you help your brother if he's bad? Right? And that's a difficulty, that's an obstacle which had to be overcome. Any ordinary person wouldn't really be able to figure out, oh, how do I help my brother who's being oppressive? But the Holy Prophet ﷺ clarified this straight away by saying that you should, if he's an oppressor, right, if he's oppressing people, then the way to help him is by holding his hand. Essentially, what's being said is that, you know, this contradiction is being harmonized very easily, that help should be rendered in both cases, if your brother is being oppressed or if he's being oppressive, you know, but depending on the situation of your brother, whether he's an oppressor or oppressed one, the form of help should change. Wonderful. So, what are we taking away from Hadith? For our younger viewers, I mean, we're focusing a little bit on, on the younger audience this year. What should they take away from this? Well, and how can they apply it to, the, to it, today? In the, in the very clearest of terms, right, um, we can establish two points here. There's two takeaway points. A brother is deserving of help in any case. Hmm. But number two, Injustice must be resisted in any case. That's what this hadith is teaching us. Be helpful. You know, that will genuinely um, help with the progression of mankind. That will genuinely benefit uh, mankind and society, right? But also keep in mind that injustice must be resisted. And that's exactly what Hazur and Varid al Talib says is talking about since he became the Khalifa of the Promised Messiah. Al -Islam. And I think if you think about it, the solution to every single problem, domestic, international, political, you know, a private life that you see where justice is not being carried out. And although the Holy Quran specifically has said that, observe justice. There's no, you know, talking about there's it. No there's, no, about there's no two ways about it. If it's against you, against your parents, against your neighbors, people you know, you don't know, you got to be just. Jazakallah, Daniel Sahib. Our next segment is uh, the cooking segment. Today we're going to take you to our MT International Studios in Germany and I believe Chef Kudus is going to show you how to make sushi today. Let's take a look. Today's dish, what I'm going to prepare is sushi and since everybody knows, for sushi you don't have to cook anything but the rice. The rest is all raw vegetables and fish. And for today's session, I have chosen two types of sushi. First will be the maki rolls, which are rolled in dried and roasted seaweed. And the other one is nigiri sushi. So before we start making the sushi, um, let's let me tell you what kind of ingredients I will choose today. I have tuna fish, 
cucumber, capsicum, I have salmon and avocado and of course the three most important ingredients for sushi are soy sauce, wasabi paste and the ginger. Why the ginger is needed for? I'll let you know later. The most delicate part of making sushi is how to cook the rice. It is very important because if your rice is not sticky enough or if it's too sticky all the effort will be in vain. So therefore what we have to do is we take the special sushi rice and drain it several times so the water you drain is uh, clear it's, it's, uh, and you can see the water. It's not that dull. Then place it in the bowl for cooking. Put um, 200 grams of rice. If you have 200 grams of rice, I would take 240 grams or 240 milliliters of water. Put it on the rice cooker for 15 minutes. Let it steam out for 30 uh, minutes. And then after that, we will take uh, 50 ml of rice vinegar, um, one or 10, 10 milliliter of mirin, which is um, a liquid of fermented rice. 25 grams of sugar and a half teaspoon of salt mix it all together and then pour it over the rice and try to mix it well with the rice but do not break the rice after that leave the rice cover it leave it for room temperature to cool it down and then your rice is ready to use now how to prepare the sushi first of all we need a bamboo mat we will cover the bamboo mat in um, plastic foil so we can use it many uh, several times. Then, of course, uh, we take the seaweed sheet on top of the bamboo uh, mat. We put some uh, rice on it. So just take a bunch of rice, place it on the seaweed and Make an even layer on the mat. Try to cover also the edges. So every, every part of the seaweed should be covered except of round about one centimeter at the opposite edge where we are going to roll the rice because this is the place or this is the one centimeter extra space you need to roll up the sushi completely. So once as you can see the rice is quite sticky. So once your seaweed sheet is covered with rice we'll take a little bit of the wasabi paste either you can use the hand or you can use a spoon and just put a slight layer of wasabi onto the rice. Now let's get to the stuffing. Maki rolls, you can use vegetable, for example cucumber. Let's take one or two stripes of capsicum. If you like to, you can use salmon. So it, usually sushi is made of raw fish. Make sure that you have good quality of your salmon or tuna fish. Place it together with the other ingredients. And now it's about to roll the sushi. You have to do the first roll together with the bamboo mat. Make sure that everything is stick together and it is tight. So you have to press the roll on both sides, the mat on both sides to tighten up the seaweed roll. Take it with the mat, make sure everything is firm and then we give it another roll. Once again, press even with your fingers. And then, last but not least, close. 
the marquee roll. Now your marquee roll is ready. Now another thing to consider for sushi is you have to have a very sharp knife. Otherwise your roll will not be cut evenly. So one cut in the half, cut both rolls evenly. One, two, two, For the nigiri sushi, I will take some water, put it on my hand, and then just form the rice with the palm of my hands, like this shape. Your palms stay a little bit wet, so all the sushi rice will not be stick to your hand. And now what you can do is you can if you like to take some wasabi paste and place it on the rice already now i have thin cut slices of tuna fish which i will use so i have one tuna nigiri or i can use fresh salmon also cut in slices of course there are so many varieties of sushi you have the california rolls as well you could prepare these are made also almost like the maki rolls but you take the rice upside down and then of course cover and coat the rice with black and white sesame seeds dear viewers these were the two common types of sushi, the maki rolls and the nigiri. Of course, there are several other varieties you can enjoy and you can discover. For example, you have sushi made like dumplings uh, and of course the California rolls where you place the rice on to the seaweed sheet, turn it around, stuff it in and then coat the rice with black and white sesame seeds. So you have the rice inside out and uh, yeah that's about it um, of sushi today i hope you will enjoy preparing and eating sushi as much as i did see you next time assalamu alaikum warahmatullah jazakumullah to our brothers at the mt international studios in germany for showing us how to make sushi probably something that not a lot of not a lot of people have probably tried in their homes but certainly something that you can do now after seeing that recipe daniel sahib one more segment we have for you and that is the book segment which book are we introducing today we're introducing the book um, titled social media now this is a collection of a beloved Hazur Sayyidullah Talab Nisla Aziz, um, his speeches and sermons, mainly Friday sermons. And what this book does is that it provides us with guidelines to safeguard ourselves against the moral ills and misuse, um, which results in you know, ills being spread in society of social media. So using it irresponsibly, right? Uh, it provides us with guidelines against that. But that's a key word, using it irresponsibly, right? Yeah. Um, because this book at the same time also provides us with a guideline of how to um, judiciously use social media for intellectual, moral and spiritual training. So the world that we live in, social media, I think it, it, it changes every, every day, if not every few minutes here and there. It's so quick, it's so fast paced. Some of the guidance that Hazur Anwar Aziz has given must be, you know, universal that you can apply five years ago six years ago as well as five years into the future because certain things simply don't change just just very briefly maybe one or two points um, that Hazuri and Vari the Latala Mitzis have mentioned that you can tell us of course um, so as you mentioned you know this guidance is universal now this example I'm about to give is from a Friday sermon in 2017 this is five years old right but it still applies to this day mm. and that's with regards to Ghaddi Basr with lowering your gaze um, which is a Quranic injunction, and it is the jihad of the self, you know, the greater jihad. So, and before, you know, going into this, Hazur um, states, and I quote, that we will be held accountable by God the Almighty more than others, because we understood the truth that the promised Messiah, al Islam, explained to us, yet we did not act upon it. 
You know, it's very, it's food for thought there, right? And the Holy Quran, um, you know, the verse that uh, tells us to perf perform Ghadda Basa, right? To keep um, our gaze lowered. Um, in light of that, beloved Hazul mentions that um, it's necessary for purity and purity is necessary in order to reach God, right? If there's no purity, we cannot find God. So in a sense, Hazul is saying that, um, you know, on social media, men especially are prohibited from seeing women, for example, with open eyes, mixing with women, uh, watching vulgar films and chatting with non-Meharam people on Facebook, etc. And this mm -hmm. all applies even to this day and age. It doesn't matter if you have a new app, yeah. you know, you know, Facebook might be 12 years old or 15 years old, you can have a new app, but this True. still applies in this modern day. Wonderful. That's exactly what I wanted to know. Daniel Saab, Jazakumullah, Sanzah for that. Atik Bharti Saab is going to present our next segment, uh, Homeopathy and Wellbeing. And uh, let's take a look. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Homeopathy and Wellbeing. In today's episode, we look at cuts and grazes. So basic, simple injuries that perhaps we've suffered or certainly we find that children often suffer from when going to the park. They can fall, perhaps cut themselves. Um, they can graze themselves on grass, playing football, or just having fun or running about in the park with their friends. So how do we treat this? What are the remedies? How can we treat it effectively? One remedy, one homeopathic medicine that one should always keep in um, one's uh, first aid kit is a remedy called aconite. It is very, very effective. Even one or two doses immediately after a cut or a graze will work wonders for the feeling of shock. Sometimes children can fall in the park and the shock sometimes will make the, bring them to tears. And of course, um, it's a very emotional time at, at that time indeed. So aconite given promptly at that time can help with that shock. As far as cuts and grazes themselves are concerned, if they are minor grazes, example, you've fallen over while playing football, or a minor cut perhaps, then calendula ointment or calendula cream is very, very good. Calendula is available as a tincture, as a herbal tincture, and this can be mixed um, in a base cream, and you can take about 2% of calendula and mix it with a base cream, and then apply this to the wounded area. And this is very, very effective, not only to stop bleeding, but also to um, facilitate healing. If there is bleeding and it's not severe, but just a, maybe a, a small, uh, tiny bit of bleeding as such, then a remedy called millifolium is very, very effective and works wonders at stopping bleeding. However, I must say that we must be very, very cautious with any cut or graze. We must be careful that such a wound does not become infected. If you feel that there is something of a serious nature, always seek professional medical advice. There is one more medicine I would like to mention, and this is Hypericum. Hypericum is really an excellent medicine for cuts, uh, especially near nerve endings. So especially if you stub your toe, um, you know, and there's a bit of blood sometimes because you've hit the nail, or perhaps around the fingernails. These are all common ailments that we do suffer from, cuts and grazes, knocks. It's part of growing up, it's part of life. But just remember, there is effective treatment in homeopathy for this. Until the next episode, Assalamu alaikum. That was Atik Bhatti Saab, our homeopathic consultant, with some of the uh, tips and some of the uh, remedies that you can find for insomnia in the field of homeopathy. Zakla Bhatti Saab for that. Daniel Saab, Zakamullah Sanzat to you as well for joining us here in the studio and for answering some of our questions. And thank you very much to our viewers at home as well. I hope and pray that you did enjoy today's program. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum. Oh, oh.